horizon of time leans back into a darkness from which the story of man begins. All lands are ancient, but the land which bears traces of man's earliest existence is somehow a more intriguing place. The ancient stirrings which still brush our souls are part of that darkness that we do not forget. We cannot forget because we reveal something that is characteristic of no other form of life. We suffer because of what we are and wish to become something else. The moment we cease to wish, our soul is dead. We changed our lives back in that darkness just as today. And science exhumes us, turning our bones in the sunlight and listening to the echo of that faraway tumult, so far away in darkness. Zarathan, a study of history and man through the science of archaeology. Every spring after the winter rains and before the searing heat of summer, this 138-foot mound is probed for its secrets by over a hundred workmen and scientists. Oh, that's a beautiful... The information they gather about this tell through the patient science of archaeology may give the world a better understanding of biblical history. It's heavy. Yeah, it's still preserved after it is out, yeah. Well, also maybe something in. I've never must have uh, a lot of sand. A lot of sand, and it's wet sand, so it'd be heavy. So that's definitely floor three, isn't it? Dr. James B. Pritchard has been director of the excavations of Telesadilla in the Jordan Valley since 1964. He is curator of biblical archaeology and professor of religious thought at the University of Pennsylvania. This tell, formed by the accumulation of life centuries ago will be under systematic excavation for at least 10 years. Archaeologists once believed that this mound was only an ancient storage pile of mud bricks. However, recent evidence may prove it to be the location of one of the oldest excavated cities on Earth. Dr. Pritchard? wonder if you'd take a look at this interesting little setup we have here. I had some interesting suggestions from some of the old timers this morning as to just precisely what they were. What's the, what's the going opinion? Well, there are several. It seems the uh, predominant one is that they were hyenas. I heard somebody say it was a boar. Do you have any well, opinion about that? Uh, that seems to be the minority view. <laughs> Did you note that uh, uh, skeleton behind us here? and the possibility that uh, these two animals might have been in conflict over it, over the carcass of it. It's a, it's a cow or a bull? It's uh, probably a young, young bull. And you think they, were, they killed each other fighting, or did the wall fall in on them? What evidence have you got for disturbance here? Well, the only example of conflict, of course, we have them jaw to jaw in combat, as it appears. It appears and in proximity to a very good uh, meal. Once we have made a discovery, the problem is to preserve what is found. In this case, paraffin is the agent. At the moment, it has to be cut away from the surrounding earth. The tools, obviously, are very primitive, but the string does as good a job as the saw. After removal from the earth, it'll be cleaned, and a plastic base placed on the whole skeleton and sent to a specialist in the United States for detailed study. The most important thing one finds in an excavation is pottery because it gives the archaeologist his time chart. Pottery was easily broken, and when broken was usually replaced by something of a different style. 
As a result of a good many years of excavation, we have built up a scale of pottery types so that usually we can tell the date that a pot was in style. Every day we take 20 or 30 baskets of bits of broken pottery from the excavation. They have to be washed carefully by men who are trained to keep track of the tags placed on these baskets. After cleaning, it is put out on mats where it dries, and then we go over it to observe the various kinds of pots, jugs, jars, juglets that occur. There are all kinds of things here. The most frequent are the cooking pots, then there are bowls, dishes, jugs, large storage jars to hold oil and wine and grain. There are lamps, there are pottery figurines, which have a religious or magical significance. In fact, almost everything you can think of was made in pottery. At the end of the day, Father John Huseman of Alma College in California, this year the field director of the expedition, helps sort out the sherds. One doesn't have to take the same care with sherds that he does with fragile objects made out of breakable material. The real information that we get from a sherd is in the form, which is the profile of the jar. We keep the important sherds. In the course of an excavation, we get something like 100 to 200,000 pieces of pottery. If one keeps all of them, he's completely confused. So the process of sorting is necessary. Occasionally, one thinks about the person who used the pot. What would he cook in it? Who broke it eventually? Here's the grid. Draftsmen, graduate students from universities, spend most of their time recording the forms of pottery and keeping records. Not all archaeology is broken bits of pottery. Occasionally, one finds pieces that deserve to go to museums. The material is generally divided between the excavator and the country in which it was found. And objects such as vases and jars find their way to the museum in Amman or the University Museum in Philadelphia. Bronze objects which are artistic as well as utilitarian. A tripod to support a bowl for burning incense. A well-worked head of a gazelle to serve as a handle to a cup. Objects in stone, such as basalt mortars for grinding grain and other food stuff, as well as containers for cosmetics and oil, imported from such distant places as Greece and the Aegean. An excavation mirrors the religious beliefs of the people. An incense burner once burned incense to a man's god. On another, a name left on the side. Yakino. The mother goddess in clay. To remove successfully the whole figure unbroken requires a workman who is well trained in the art of excavation. These men come from their farms and return to their farms at the end of each day. Work begins at the dig at seven in the morning and ends at two in the afternoon. Some specialists are imported from Jericho. We've had many years of experience in excavating. These are the men who use the trowel, the more delicate object which replaces the pick in areas that are crucial. Finally, the dirt is sifted, sometimes by hand, to find small objects.
The rubber-tired wheelbarrow is the great boon for moving earth, an innovation which was introduced into this village by our excavation only four years ago. The dump head is the measure of one's activity. A huge amount of earth which has been robbed of its evidence and other artifacts of interest. The trowel man is the key person. It's up to him to extract, finally, an object which has been embedded for centuries in the earth. Success depends upon skill as well as patience and careful attention. The record is all important. Every object must be photographed in place as it is found. Every expedition has an architect or an architect and surveyor who measures accurately every wall, places it on paper. When this plan is complete, it is later published and made available in libraries, so that in reality, the plan of a house is not lost. When we found that all the 8th century houses had to be removed, that these would no longer be available as examples of city planning in the 8th century BC, we decided to reconstruct one of the houses out of ancient material to exactly the same measurements as the original houses. A second time visitor to Telesadilla this year is an interested friend from the Southern Baptist Convention, Dr. Paul M. Stevens. Tell me something about the methods of excavation that were used, that are generally used by archaeologists. There have been two major methods. One is to cut a trench through like the area, done here? Uh, as we've done here, a trench and record the stratification of various settlements or cities. The other is to strip the, the mound completely and get the architecture. Uh, if you cut a trench, you don't get much architecture. If you strip, you, you get all the architecture, but you don't get the vertical arrangement. So that we combine this here and cut little trenches of five meters square to record, first of all, the depth. And then we take these out and get the broad expanse of the city with its walls and streets. What would be the number one uh, contribution you feel that has been uncovered here? Of course, it's hard to see in the long run what's important. Everything is important eventually. Uh, the thing which seems the moment most important was the discovery in 1964 of the Queen's Tomb. What part was that? Which is on the lower part, lower mound here, uh, a tomb of a very wealthy woman who had burial objects that had come all the way from such distant places as Egypt in the south and uh, the Aegean area in the west. Number two, I should say, is the stairway, which is a civil defense measure that was used here in the 12th, 11th century BC. It runs from the top of the tell down to the water supply of the village. Now, this was, in fact, a secret tunnel by which the inhabitants of the city could get to the water supply when the city was under attack. When the gates were shut and the enemy was outside, water carriers from inside the city wall went down these more than 100 steps to the water source at the foot of this tell. Now, the spring is still a major source of supply for our water and was the water supply when this was built, probably about 1200 BC. Eventually, the roof, which served as a camouflage for this system, fell in, and it was covered up. It was not discovered until 1964, uh, when we happened to sink two tre trenches on the north side of the tell. Uh, this system of water supply is known from other sites in this country, 
but this is the first time we have found one that was not cut through solid rock. It was a built tunnel on the outside of the tell. It's not only an interesting architectural feature, but it also gives us some insight into the, the psychology and the feelings of people. They were fearful of attack. And they also had the initiative to protect themselves by this civil defense measure. Is there a comparable uh, situation in other digs that you... The most famous arrangement of this sort was the famous tunnel of Hezekiah in Jerusalem, which Hezekiah cut in the year 701 or shortly before. Uh, to protect Jerusalem against the attack of Sennacherib. And uh, this is recorded in the Bible, and the tunnel is there for everybody to see today, where he cut a long tunnel of 1,200 cubits through the solid rock to bring the water from the spring inside the city so the city couldn't be uh, starved out by an its siege. Right. Right. And there are others at Megiddo, and we found one at Gibeon uh -huh. in 1956 when we were digging there. Mm -hmm. Very interesting one. Are there streets here? Yes, there are all kinds of streets. Uh, it's a grid, uh, streets running north and south, and others going east-west. But again, a street, what did it consist of? How wide would a street have been? A street's wide enough for two donkeys to pass. Uh -huh. be considered a fair-sized street, roughly three or four feet. Uh -huh. They're generally paved because they also served as drains. The water from the houses came into the street and went out of the city by means of the street. Are there any finds in the streets, uh, artifacts? Uh, sometimes one gets uh, pieces of broken pottery that are of great importance for diagnosing the, the period of use. They were just tossed out into the street? Thrown in the street. You had no street cleaning department here. No. For that well, reason, the street frequently built up two or three feet higher than the floor of the house. So one had to go up the steps to get from his house to the street. I believe I've seen that in other places. You mentioned uh, being destroyed. Uh, what, uh, do you have evidence of oh, We have burning here. Perhaps if we walk down here, I can show you better All right. the uh, evidences for burning. Here we have a very good example of the history of this site being written in this, this book. This is the floor of a 9th or 8th century, early 8th century house. One day, it was destroyed by fire. And you can see here the evidence of the roof in this line, and this line, and this line. I think you, you'll find that's good roof ash, the beams of the roof. Perfect powder. Well, what happened was that this collapsed, and this piece of, of brick came on top of this piece of roof, another brick here, and you had just a building up of this floor in a matter of a few minutes to this level and this is sealed in the floor, all the objects which were here. And they've remained for 2,800 years. What name have you given this city? Is there a, t a name ascribed to it yet? Uh, we have calculated guess that it was the biblical city of Zarathan. Where is that mentioned in the Bible? It's mentioned several times, most prominently, uh, it's mentioned in connection with the casting of the bronzes in Solomon's temple. In, in 1 Kings, there's a verse which says that Solomon had the bronze vessels of the temple cast in the plain between Zarathan and Succoth. The Jordan River was, of course, the, the source of water for irrigating this very fertile valley. I doubt there was any commerce on the Jordan River. It's not like the Nile, the Euphrates, the River of Commerce, but it is a source of water. The uh, tell is actually only about a mile from the river. If we were to put it here on this plan, the river is, of course, rather small. 
comes up here, and you rise up to a slight tell, and then the large mound which we're digging comes around like this. And on the very top of this tell, we have begun a trench. It'd be utterly impossible to dig this whole hole. We're area. standing in that now. We're standing in this trench on the lowest point to which we've come, and we've come down a very short distance in this mound, which is, I think, 138 feet above the level of the plain. What would you date this level we're standing uh, We're We're standing now on the early 8th century B.C., or we're standing on a level which is approximately shortly after Elijah and Elisha. Now, what we propose to do in future seasons is to continue this trench on downward till we reach the virgin soil. How many levels there'll be, we have no way of telling, but this is a great question mark. If you keep going, though, it's entirely possible that uh, Zarathan, or this spot, could uh, predate Jericho? It's possible. Uh, at the moment, we know that this place was inhabited at uh, approximately 3000 BC. We know this from pottery, characteristic pottery that's found along this, this bench. Now, how far down this, this uh, sounding will take us, we, we don't know. There's no way of telling. Did the valley look something like it does now? I suspect that this, uh, this valley was rather more barren than you see it today. Uh, from what we can learn, uh, there was a great deal of irrigation here in the early Bronze Age, or 5,000 years ago. And the water from the Jordan River was diverted into canals, and this was probably very fertile 5,000 years ago. And if the present system of irrigation continues as it has in the past uh, three years through the East Gore Canal, bringing the water of the Yarmouk down. Uh, this whole area will be as prosperous, uh, prosperous as it was 5,000 years ago. Or more so? Possibly more. This general area would be identified in the Bible by what name? The province or region? The immediate area is the Jordan Valley. The area to the east of us is the area of Gilead. To the west of us is, is Ephraim, a division that's, that's referred to frequently in the Bible. Dr. Pritchard, do these people that lived in this city, uh, there ought to be a great deal of information about them. What kind of people were they? What did they do for a social life, business life, cultural, food, clothing? Well, that's a very interesting question. The uh, average person who lived here, let's say, in the 12th century, spent an awful lot of his time working. He, had, he was an agriculturalist. He worked in the fields. At the same time, he was, he was interested in play. Um, there were family activities. There were certainly games. Uh, every now and then, we find uh, things which correspond to checkers that children play, and adults too. Um, but work, uh, work was pretty serious business. What about education? Education was a matter of the family, I su suspect. Uh, these people were not well educated in our sense. Very few of them could read or write. Yeah. to judge from the, the bits of writing that turn up here. They were knowledgeable, but not... They were knowledgeable and they were wise, but they weren't uh, particularly literate. And the tradition of knowledge was passed on orally rather than in a written form, I suspect. Were they uh, tiny people? To judge from the uh, remains in the cemetery, they, they were of all sizes. The largest skeleton we have found is over six feet tall. Isn't that unusual? The, it's quite unusual. Uh, the uh, average is, is something like uh, five, six, seven. But occasionally you find one that's uh, six feet. Was much of their life spent in war? Or under conditions, warlike conditions? 
Uh, I'm sure it was because of the, the prevalence of, of weapons, such as arrowheads, javelin heads. These were made of bronze and have been preserved, of course. Was this the, 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 uh, the record that one finds in the tell here of destructions would indicate that some of these, by the law of averages, were due to enemy attack. Would these people have been aware of the children of Israel coming into this area when uh, the biblical description of their arrival? I'm sure they were. This, this uh, Jordan River was the great barrier which, which kept the children of Israel out, as you know. And here is a major fortified city on the Jordan within sight of the place where the Israelites crossed. And even though they didn't attack this city, the people here would certainly be able to look down this valley and see the disturbance caused by these people. Well, you came here in 1964. That was your first uh, attack on this uh, hill. I remember it well, the 1st of January. 1st of January. And you have intimated that um, you may take a total of 10 years to complete this project. Do you feel that it's worth it? Well, I thought about that. Um, what is one going to contribute by his labor? There's a possibility here in this soil, which is yet to be removed, of finding historical data which will be useful to people who live after we're gone. And this is a kind of permanent investment of one's time in the, the collecting of information which will throw some light on, on man's past and upon the history of, of a country in which such significant significant things happen. I think that the future is to a great extent dependent upon the past. And the more we can learn about our history and our past, the better off we're going to be in the future. one in a series dealing with issues and problems of today. If you'd like an in-depth discussion of one of our most urgent problems, write to The Human Dimension, Fort Worth, Texas, 76116. And ask for booklet number four, Pollution. The Human Dimension is presented by this station as a public service, with production costs paid by the Southern Baptist Radio and Television Commission.